All right, and here we are. As yes, usual, the frame rate's too slow. Hello, good evening. It is Sunday again. I'm Tad, and here we are. And I first question I know you're asking is like, dude, where did you get that totally, totally sweet shirt? You look like you should be in the Avengers or something. You're right. It's completely badass. I'm wearing it because um, it was just my friend Rick's birthday. And uh, Rick bought this for me sometime back. Uh, got it on some weird Chinese retail, you know, website. Some strange, mysterious place that you probably don't want to know too much about. But it's, I figured I had to wear it in honor of Rick's birthday. So, so that's what I'm wearing. It is pretty cool, though, isn't it? Um, we got it actually as band clothing, but uh, I don't know if uh, everybody else liked the shirt as much as I did. Um, anyway, so hi. Greetings. Hello. Nice to see you all. Um, I am going to check in very quickly and say hello to people first before all these things disappear. And then we will come back and talk about what we're going to be doing and whatever else might be going on in the world. So... First and foremost, there is Mr. Jerry Unangst, Mr. Unangst, Mr. Unangst, and Chris. Hello, Chris. Guten Morgen. Good to see you. Holger, hello, and good to see you too. Hazel, hello, my darling. That is my mother-in-law, and much love to you, my dear. Good to see you. However, at however much of a remove, unfortunately, that we are forced into by distance, and time zones. But anyway, it is lovely to see you. Julian, hello, very good to see you too. Anamika, hi, good evening, good morning, good whatever it is, wherever you are, wherever anybody is. Sean, hello, Sean, good to see you. Holger, yes, good to see you too. I know, it is It is nice. Um, and uh, it really brings out my embonpoint, my my cleavage. Um, <laughs> Dirk, hello, hello. Best wishes to you too. Kristen, good evening. Good morning, actually. Early morning, because you're in my part of the world. Ilva, hello. Lovely to see you too. Huggles back. And Christine, a pleasure as always. Lovely to see you. Now, I got over the tick bite much more easily this time, I think, because I got it so fast. Um, the last time, I got tick bitten. I didn't find out for quite some time. And uh, as you may remember, some of you who were around then, I got like really miserable and I got all kinds of weird symptoms and full blown allergy, like um, anaphylactic shock almost of a kind. Nothing like that this time. I just had weird, um, you know, kind of markings around the tick bite, but they're gone now. So I'm okay. But thank you for asking. Wouter, hello. Good evening to you and also Iris. Hello and hello on behalf of Iris also. Mark, good morning to you too. Mahmoud, good to see you. Um, except, yes, I and thank you for sending me the pronunciation. I was very close. It's more of a Mahmoud than a Mahmoud. Mahmoud, Mahmoud. Um, but Mahmoud. Anyway, I was I, I was close enough. So, but thank you for for giving me a better pronunciation. Uh, Jeremy, hello, good to see you too. And there is my sister-in-law. Hello, Lisa, good to see you, sweetie. And all love to you and the family. And Marianne, hello and good morning, Germany. Guten Morgen, Deutschland. And and of course, good morning, England, and everywhere else in America, and all the other white places that people are checking in from. Good to see you. Um, nothing super out of the ordinary to report this week. Working on things, working on, um, as I mentioned, the uh, the rewrite, or not the rewrite, the, um, what do we call it, the copy edited version. Um, and uh, of the uh, manuscript for Narrow Dark, Into the Narrow Dark, and I'm about three quarters of the way through that, should have that finished in the next few days. 
doing work with Isaac Stewart and um, Ron, one of one of my dear helpers, Ron Hyde, who along with Ilva and Jeremy and Angela are the people who kind of keep me on the straight and narrow as far as my Ostenard history and geography goes. Um, so we're working on the maps for that book. And um, I'll be very soon getting back to also to uh, the Navigator's Children, the final part. Deb is making blankets. That's what she's at at the moment. And she's very, very wrapped up in it. Um, all, kids are all fine. As I mentioned last week, I think we're all boosted here. So we're just kind of hanging in, staying out of trouble. Um, what else is there to report? Cat is over on the floor um, being a cat. Uh, and uh, the dogs are upstairs snoozling, and that's basically it. Not a heck of a lot to report this time. I'm um, trying to think of anything else that happened that's of interest this week. Not really much of anything. Again, um, maybe, maybe not, but like many of you may be, I basically am not going out unless I really, really need to. So, you know, we're we're every now and then I have to run out to the store for something or we have to run to the post office to send something or, you know, whatever. Um, and on very rare occasions, I think we've been to one movie um, in the last several months and outside the house and um, maybe one restaurant. It seems to me like we went to a restaurant sometime back. Um, but basically, you know, we're just, we're still lying low here because, you know, because we're, you know, we, we've got um, one kid with um, some special, uh, not special, ad, ad, not the word I want to use, but with some uh, worries about getting COVID. So we are more cautious maybe than some people are, um, even though obviously the Omicron variant doesn't seem to be as bad, but still we don't really want to take risks. So we're kind of hunkered down, but you know, as I was just saying to my mom on the phone today, you know, it's not like it's anything new for us. It's not like, oh my God, I'm having to work from home now. It's like I've been working from home since 1990, um, you know, all the time, full time working from home and um, still doing the same job. So, you know, not really a lot of changes. There are moments, believe me, there are moments when like any semi-sane person where I say, I'm going crazy and, you know, going back and forth from one room to another and basically, you know, three rooms as far as I'm concerned, because all the young people have their own rooms and, you know, just walk into those. Those are their rooms and that's where they go to have a little privacy. So I basically float back and forth between the, the Debs in my room and the office and then, you know, the, the living room if nobody is loudly playing Five Nights at Freddy's or Super Mario Kart or something because that's difficult on my my uh, my nerves and my ability to think. So there are times, God knows, there are times where I will suddenly feel like, oh my God, I'm snowed in. It's winter time. I'm stuck in the cabin. Uh, you know, um, but not really. And it's California, so you know we can go out in the backyard and all, but very smallest kind of fraction of of time in which it's actually really raining hard or really really cold it's never really really cold I was watching a f football game today um, which uh, our local my local team the team I root for was playing in Green Bay Wisconsin and I was reminded from my one long stay in Wisconsin what it's like there this time of the year and saying, you know, I'm just too damn Californian. I'm really used to this. I'm used to more moderate weather than that. And bless those people, you know, for having the strength to get through nasty, nasty winters. But I think it's too late for me. I think I'm gonna be a, a kind of a, a moderate weather person the rest of my life. Anyway, anything else to report? Nah, I'm, in, I'm in the middle of many different home projects. So, you know, all kinds of domestic stuff and we have to fix a bathroom. So that's gonna be, turn into a massive job, which I won't have to do because it's too real for, for somebody like, you know, for me to do my house husband thing and, you know, put in a few screws or something like that. It's gonna be a major tear down, re, remodel thing. 
Um, but so that's occupying some of our brain space and, you know, just the usual stuff. And, you know, I'm helping the kids with some projects and I'm slowly trying to clean the office. You c could not possibly tell by looking behind me, but there are certain organizational things that are happening that will pay off at some point. And other than that, I'm abusing um, the children and animals in my in my charge uh, whenever possible. And that's about it. So that's the news. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are going to go back to Otherland tonight. And specifically, I don't know why I keep showing this, but it's the same bunch of people watching virtually every time. So I'm sure you've now all seen me hold up the book a zillion times like, Surprise, <laughs> we're reading from the first Otherland book tonight. Whoa, <laughs> fooled you. And you're all like, yeah, right. Um, but anyway, so um, we are going to continue to read from that. The last thing I remember we were reading, yes, is that F Felix Jongleur, who's kind of the head of the Grail Brotherhood, who are the people who have built this network this network that is apparently also pulling children into it somehow or, or putting them into comas somehow when they come into contact with it. But they're building this giant virtual network for themselves. Um, and although the reasons are not entirely clear at this point in the story, and Felix Jongleur, who's the main guy because he has control of the operating system, which is quite mysterious, uh, Jean Glour likes to um, represent himself. He likes to live because he's, he's like extremely old and his body is basically dying and he, he's in a vat, you know, or something like that, right? He's in a, in a big tank somewhere um, in New Orleans, actually, or outside New Orleans. So he um, likes to clothe himself within his virtual world as Osiris, the... Egyptian god of the dead, but also in some Egyptian religions, the chief god in the Egyptian pantheon, and force the rest of the Grail Brotherhood, who have no interest in this stuff at all, I and mean, they're interested in what Jean Glour can help them get, but they have no interest in his own personal weirdness and his, his Egyptian gods thing and all that. But he forces them to dress up, essentially, they're in virtual space, but essentially to wear and be referred to by code names of the Egyptian gods. So that's what's going on in this part. Um, so let me see. Anyway, um, so, and we know for a fact that some of these people have already appeared in the story one way or the other. Um, we're seeing them in their quote unquote Egyptian god personas, but um, Ta, which by the way is spelled P-T-A-H, Ta is actually Robert Wells, who's a, an American software multi-billionaire, um, also quite old. Um, and uh, Horace the Falcon is a General Yacoubian, General Daniel Yacoubian. Um, and we met a couple of others here, including uh, Thoth, who is actually uh, Jun Bao, a Chinese billionaire and the, probably the most powerful man in China, and various others, including Sekhmet, who I think comes up a bit in this next segment, who is another billionaire. Um, she is the head of a company called Critipong Electronics and is a bit of an Imelda Marcos type, if you're old enough to remember Imelda Marcos. Anyway, so that's where we are. So I'm going to just jump back into this because we were in the middle of a section here. Please, please, he said at last, this is Jean Gouler talking, I will be happy to talk to any of you individually who are worried about this. The problem, however minor, has its source in my own personal initiative. Oh, there they've been talking about the person who has escaped into the system and can't be found, who the intelligent reader like yourself has already figured out at this point is probably Paul Jonas. Um, who's wandering first from uh, first from the First World War, and now he's in basically Alice's Through the Looking Glass um, world. Anyway, um, the problem, however minor, has its source in my own personal initiative. I take complete responsibility. 
that at least silenced the table. And behind the emotionless sims, behind the beetle mandibles, the masks of hippo, ram, and crocodile, he knew that calculations were being made. Odds were being re-examined. But he also knew that his prestige was such that even self-satisfied Ta would not argue with him any further at risk of seeming divisive. Oh, were it not for the grail at the end of this long, wearisome road, he thought, I would happily see the whole of this greedy lot buried in a mass grave. It is sad that I need the Brotherhood so badly. This thankless chairmanship is like trying to teach table manners to Piranha. Behind his corpse mask, he smiled briefly, although the various teeth and fangs glinting along the length of the table lent the image a certain unpleasant ring of truth. Now, if we have dispatched other business, and if the problem of our little runaway has been tabled for the time being, there is only one other thing, the matter of our former colleague, Shu. He turned to Horace with mock concern. Uh, you do realize that Shu is only a code name, another little bit of Egyptiana? A joke of sorts, actually, since Shu was the sky god who abdicated the throne of heaven in favor of Ra. You do understand that, General. We have so few living ex-colleagues, I felt sure you would not require translation. The falcon eyes glittered. I know who you're talking about. Good. In any case, I took it as the sense of our last full meeting that Shu has become, since his retirement, a liability to the old firm. He allowed himself a dusty check, chuckle. I have initiated certain processes designed to reduce that liability as much as possible. Say what you mean. Sekhmet's tongue lolled from her tawny muzzle. The one you call Shu is to be killed. Osiris leaned back. Your grasp of our needs is admirable, madam, but overly simple. There is more to be done than that. I could have a black bag team on top of him in twelve hours. Clear out the whole compound, burn it to the foundations, take the gear back home for study. Horace lifted a hand to his hooked beak, an odd gesture that Osiris needed several seconds to decode. Back in R.L., real life, the general had lit himself a cigar. Thank you, but this is a weed whose roots go deep. Shu was a founding member of our Ennead, excuse me, general, of our brotherhood. Such roots must be carefully uncovered and the whole plant taken in one reaping. I have initiated such a process, and I will lay the plans before you at our next meeting. With just enough obvious flaws, he thought, to give imbeciles like you something to piss upon, General. Osiris was impatient now for the meeting to end. Then I will thank you for your clever suggestions, and you will let me get on with the real business of protecting our interests. Anything else, he said out loud, then I thank you for joining me. I wish you all good luck in your various projects. One by one, the gods winked out until Osiris was alone again. The austere lines of the western palace had been transmuted into the lamplit homeliness of Abydus that was. The scent of myrrh and the chants of the resurrected priests rose around him like the soothing waters of a warm bath. He dared not bring the full panoply of his godliness to the Brotherhood's gatherings. He was already regarded as slightly, although harmlessly, eccentric, but he was far more comfortable being Osiris now than the all-too-mortal man underneath, and he missed the comforts of his temple when he was forced to leave it. He crossed his arms across his chest and called forward one of his high priests. Summon the lord of the mummy wrappings. I am ready now to grant him audience. The priest, whether software or sim, the god could not guess and did not care, hurried away into the darkness at the back of the temple. 
A moment later, the arrival of Anubis was proclaimed by a skirling fanfare. The priests fell back, pressing themselves against the temple walls. The dark jackal head was raised and alert as though testing the air. The god was not certain whether he liked this change from the messenger's usual sullenness. I'm here. The god stared at him for a moment. It was appropriate, this guise he had chosen for his favorite tool. He had spotted the youth's potential quite early and had devoted many years to raising him, not like a son, heaven forbid, but like a trained hound, shaping him to the tasks for which he was best suited. But, like any spirited beast, this one sometimes became over-exuberant or even defiant. Sometimes a taste of the whip was necessary. But he had been giving Anubis more than a taste lately, and that was unfortunate. Too much punishment dulled its effect. Perhaps this was an occasion to try something a little different. I am not happy about your South American subcontractors, he began. The jackal head lowered slightly, anticipating a rebuke. They are impertinent, to say the least. They are, grandfather. Too late, Anubis remembered his master's dislike of that particular honorific. The narrow muzzle flinched again ever so slightly. The god pretended it hadn't happened. But I know how such things can be. The best are often ambitious in their own right. They think they know more than those who employ them, even when their employers have invested time and money in their training. The sharp-eared head tilted, just like a real canine, expressing puzzlement. Anubis was wondering what other message was being delivered here. In any case, if they are the best for the job, you must employ them. I have seen their request, and I am now sending you the terms within which you may bargain with them. You, you are going to deal with them? We are going to hire them? If they fail to serve to our satisfaction, they will, of course, not receive the reward they seek. If they do perform, well, I will consider at that time whether to honor the bargain. There was a pause in which he could sense the messenger's disapproval. The god was amused by that. Even murderers had a sense of propriety. If you cheat them, the word will travel very quickly. If I cheat them, I will be very sure to do it in such a way that no one will ever know. If they happen to meet with an accident, for instance, it will be something so clearly not of our doing that you need not worry about your other contacts taking fright. The god laughed. You see, my faithful one, you have not learned everything from me yet, after all. Perhaps you should wait a little longer before thinking to strike out on your own. Anubis responded slowly. And how do I know you will not some day do the same to me? The god leaned forward to lay his flail almost lovingly against the jackal's sloping forehead. Rest assured, my messenger, if I saw the need, I would. If you rely solely on my honor to protect you, you are not the servant in whom I wish to place my trust. Behind the mask, behind the complexity of instrumentation, Osiris smiled as he watched Anubis quite visibly consider whatever safeguards he had put in place to protect himself against his master. But betrayal is a tool that must be used very discreetly, the god continued. It is only because I am known for honoring my agreements that I could, if I wished, dispose of these overly forward sisters. Remember, honor is the only really good disguise for an occasional act of dishonor. No one trusts a known liar. I uh, observe and learn, O oh Lord. Good. I'm glad to find you in a receptive mood. Perhaps you will give your careful attention to this as well. The god flicked his crook, and a small box appeared in the air, hovering before his throne. 
Inside it was a grainy, hologrammatic representation of two men wearing disheveled suits standing on either side of a desk. They might have been salesmen except for the photographs spread across the desk's untidy surface. See the pictures there, Osiris asked. We are lucky the public constabulary's financial restraints mean they still rely on two-dimensional representations. Otherwise, this might make for quite a dizzying effect, not unlike the mirrors in a barber shop. He expanded the cube until the figures were life-size and the photos could be easily viewed. Why are you showing me this? Oh, come now. The god nodded and the two figures inside the cube sprang into life. Number four, no difference, the first man was saying. Except this time the writing was on the victim herself, not on something she was carrying. He pointed to one of the photos. The word SANG, S-A-N-G, was printed in block capitals across her stomach, the bloody letters smearing into the greater redness below. And still no hits on it. A name, a place. I assume we've given up on the possibility of it being a reference to informing. None of these people were informers. These are ordinary folk. The first cop shook, shook his head in frustration. And once again, we got blurring on the surveillance cameras, like someone took an electromagnet to them. But the lab says no magnet was used. Shit. The second cop stared at the pictures. Shit, shit, shit. Something will come up. The first man sounded almost convincing. These blokes always screw up somewhere along the line. Get cocky, you know? Or they just get too crazy? The god gestured, and the cube dwindled away to a spark. His long silence was alleviated only by the moans of the kneeling priests. I have spoken to you about this before, he said at last. Anubis did not reply. It is not so much the messiness of your compulsions that offend me, the god continued, allowing anger to creep into his voice for the first time. All artists have their quirks, and I consider you to be an artist, but your methodology displeases me. You have consistently advertised your peculiar talents in a way that may eventually prove your undoing. They tested you repeatedly in those institutions, you know. Someday soon, even the plodding Australian police will make some connection there. But, most unfortunate of all, you are advertising by your little signatures, however obliquely, something that is far more important to me than you are. I do not know what you think you know of my work, but the San Graal is not a joke for you to snigger at. The god rose to his feet and for a moment allowed a hint of something larger to smear itself around him, a blurring, lightning-charged shadow. His voice rumbled like a summer storm. Do not misunderstand me. If you compromise my project, I will deal with you swiftly. And finally, if such a situation comes to pass, whatever protections you think you have will blow away like straws in a hurricane. He allowed himself to settle back onto into his throne. Otherwise, I am pleased with you, and it hurts me to upbraid you. Do not allow this to happen again. Find a less idiosyncratic way to slake your compulsions. If you please me, you will find that there are rewards you cannot even imagine. I do not exaggerate. Am I understood? The jackal head wagged as if its owner were exhausted. The god looked for a hint of defiance, but saw only fear and resignation. Good he said. Then our audience is finished. I look forward to your next prog progress report on the Sky God Project. Next week? Anubis nodded, but did not look up. The god crossed his arms 
and death's messenger disappeared. Osiris sighed. The old, old man inside the god was weary. The interview with his underling hadn't gone too badly, but now it was time to talk to the dark one, the other, the one creature in all the world that he feared. Work, 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 and none of it pleasant anymore. Only the grail could be worth such heartache, such suffering. Death cursed sourly and got on with it. Chapter 15, Friends in High Places. Netfeed News. Six powers sign Antarctica Pact. Visual, metal wreckage scattered across ice flow. Voiceover. The twisted wreckage of fighter jets will remain as a mute reminder of the short-lived but disastrous Antarctic conflict. Representatives of the six powers whose disagreement over mineral rights began the conflict met in Zurich to sign a treaty re-establishing Antarctica as an international territory. She met Kabu on the bus at Pinetown Station. He sprang from his seat when he saw her as though she had fainted in the aisle instead of merely stopping to take a breath after climbing the steps. Are you all right? She gestured for him to sit, then slid into the seat beside him. I'm well. Just a little short of breath. I haven't been getting around much lately. He frowned. I would have come to meet you. I know. That's why I wouldn't let you. You've been all the way out to my flat block three times now since I had my... since I got ill. All I had to do was catch a local bus to get here. Ten minutes. Kabu, of course, had probably been on the bus for almost an hour already. The service from Chesterville was not particularly fast. I am worried for you. You have been very poorly. His concerned look was almost stern, as though she were a child playing in a dangerous place. She laughed. I told you, it wasn't a full-blown heart attack, just a temporary arrhythmia. I'm okay now. Rini didn't want anyone worrying over her, over her, even Kabu. It made her feel weak, and she didn't trust weakness. She was also growing uncomfortable about the burden of responsibility she had dropped on her small friend. He had completed his coursework, so he was not losing study time, but what money he had must be running out, while she was using up an unconscionable amount of his energies. Only the fact that his safety, too, now seemed compromised had convinced her to drag him along on this errand. But it was my problems that exposed him to danger in the first that exposed him to danger in the first place, she thought miserably. What are you going to do now that you finish the course? she asked. Are you going to do a, do a graduate program? A certain melancholy crept over his delicate features. I, I do not know, Rini. I am thinking. There are things I do not know yet. I told you something of my plans, but I see now that I am far from being ready to make them real. Also, his voice dropped conspiratorially. He looked up and down the aisle of the bus as though checking for spies. Also, he continued quietly, I am thinking and thinking of the experience I had when we were in that place. The rasp of gears changing as the bus cornered was deafening. Rini suppressed a smile. Any eavesdropper would have to be a lip reader. If I can help you in any way, she said, please tell me. I owe you a lot. I could help you find a grant, maybe. The bushman shook his head vigorously. It is not money. It is more difficult than that. I wish it were a city problem. Then I could ask my friends and find a city answer. But in this place where I live now, I must discover the answer to this problem myself. Now it was, it was Rini's turn to shake her head. I'm not sure I understand. Neither am I. 
Kabu smiled, banishing his own somber look, but Rini saw his conscious effort and felt a momentary pang of sadness. Was this what he had learned in Durban and in the other places where what he called city people lived? To dissemble? To hide his feelings and show a false seeming? I suppose I should be grateful he's not that good at it, yet. The bus was climbing an overpass. Kabu was staring out the window and down at the riverine expanse of National Route 3, at the cars packed into it even in mid-morning like termites in a split log. Suddenly uncomfortable with the symptoms of modern life she normally took for granted, Rini turned away to examine their fellow passengers. Most of them were older black women, heading for Kloof and the other west wealthy northeastern suburbs to work as domestics, just as they and their predecessors had for decades, both before and after liberation. The chubby woman nearest her, head wrapped in a traditional but now slightly old-fashioned headscarf, wore a look that someone less familiar with it than Rini would have called blank. It was not hard to see how white South Africans in the old apartheid days, facing that expressionless stare, would have projected onto it any emotions they wished. Sullenness, stupidity, even the potential for murderous violence. But Rini had grown up around such women and knew that the expression was a mask that they wore like a uniform. At home or in the shabin or tea shop, they would smile and laugh easily. But working for the volatile whites, it had always been easier to show nothing. If you showed nothing, the white boss could not take offense or feel pity or, as was sometimes worse, presume to a friendship that could never really exist under such inequality. Rini had white colleagues at the poly, and some she even socialized with after work. But... As Pine Town had become a mixed neighborhood, the whites that could afford to had moved out, out to places like Kluf and the Berea Ridge Top, always to the high places as if their black neighbors and co-workers were not individuals but part of some vast dark tide drowning the lowlands. If institutionalized racism was gone, the dividing wall of money was as high as it had ever been. There were blacks in all industries now, and at all levels, and blacks had held most of the top jobs in government since the liberation, but South Africa had never quite climbed out of its third world hole, and the 21st century had not been any kinder to Africa than had the 20th. Most blacks were still poor, and most whites, for whom the trans transition to black rule had not been anywhere near as bad as they had feared, were not. As she looked around, Rini's gaze was arrested by a young man a few seats behind her. Despite the overcast day, he was wearing sunglasses. He had been watching her, but when his eyes, or his lenses, met her stare, he turned quickly to look out the window. She felt a moment of reflexive fear, but then she saw the shunt at the base of his skull, just peeping from beneath his cap, and understood. She turned away, clutching her bag a little tighter to her lap. After a moment, she cautiously turned to look again. The charge head was still staring out the window, fingers jittering on the seat back, seat back in front of him. His clothes were wrinkled and sweat-stained at the armpits. The Nero cannula was a township job, and the insertion had been cheap and dirty. She could see a gleam of separation around the edge of the plastic. A slight pressure on her leg made her jump. Kabu raised his eyes, questioning. It's nothing, she said. I'll tell you later. She shook her head. There had been a charge pit in one of the flats when she and Stephen and her father had first moved in, and she had more than once encountered its zombie denizens in the stairwell. They were generally harmless. Extended use of charge gear with its high-speed strobing and infrasound, tended to make a person uncoordinated and passive. But she had never been comfortable around them, however loopy and withdrawn they seemed. She had been violently pawed on a bus when she was a student by a man 
who clearly wasn't seeing her at all, but was reacting to some unimaginable vision induced by pounding his brain into jelly. And afterwards, she had never been able to laugh at charge heads the way her friends did. In fact, they had turned out to be not so harmless after all, but the police didn't seem capable of doing much. So after several of the older residents had been robbed and some of the flats had been burglarized, a vigilante group, her father had been part of it, had taken cudgels and cricket bats and kicked down the door. The skinny creatures inside had not put up much of a fight, but heads were still split and ribs were cracked. Rini had seen the charge heads in nightmares for months after, tumbling down the stairs in slow motion, flapping their arms like drowning men, and making hooting noises that sounded more animal than human. They had been almost incapable of defending themselves, as though this sudden eruption of anger and pain were only a further, if somewhat unsatisfactory, part of the charge. Still in the midst of her idealistic student phase, Rini had been shocked when she discovered that her father and the other men had taken the equipment and gear they found there, cheap Nigerian stuff mostly, and sold it drinking up the returns over the succeeding week while retelling the story of their victory. As far as she knew, none of the building's robbery victims had ever received a share of the profits. Long Joseph Sulawayo and others and the others had won the prerogative of conquerors, the right to divide the booty. Actually, the effect she had suffered in Mr. J's was not that different from charge, although far more sophisticated. Is that what they'd done? Found some way to hyperpower a charge high? Supercharge it, as it were? Then put in some kind of hypnotic shackle to keep the victims from breaking the loop? Rini, Kabu patted her leg again. She shook her head, realizing that she had been staring into space just as fixedly as the man with a can in his head. Sorry, just thinking about something. I would like to ask you about the person we are going to see. She nodded. I was going to tell you, I just got sidetracked. She used to be a teacher of mine at the University of Natal. And she taught you, what is your degree called? Virtual engineering? Rini laughed. That's what they called it, all right. Sounds kind of quaint, doesn't it? Like being a doctor of electricity or something. But she was brilliant. I'd never met anyone like her. And she was a real South African, in the best sense of the word. When the RAND dropped so badly, all the other white professors, and even a lot of the Asian and black ones, were sending their CVs off to Europe and America, she just laughed at them. Van Bleeks have always been here, since the 16th century, she always said. We've been here so long you can't pull the roots out. We're not bloody Afrikaners, we're Africans. But that's her name, by the way, Susan Van Bleek. If she is your friend, Kabu said solemnly, then she will be my friend too. You'll like her, I'm sure. God, I haven't seen her in person for a long time. It must be almost two years. But when I called her, she just said, Come on up, I'll give you lunch, like I'd been dropping by every other week. The bus was laboring now, climbing the steep hills into Kloof. The houses, so close together down below, seemed to be a little more snobbish here in the highlands, each keeping a careful distance from its neighbors, surrounding itself with a discreet drapery of trees. The smartest person I know, Rini said. There was a car waiting at the bus station, an expensive-looking electric Ilozi. Standing beside it, dressed in immaculate casual clothing, was a tall, middle-aged black man who introduced himself as Jeremiah Dako. He did not say much more before ushering Rini and Kabu into the car's back seat. Rini suggested that one of them could ride in the front, but the man's only reply was a chilly smile. After her initial conversational volleys were returned with minimum effort on his part, she gave up and watched the scenery slide by. 
uninterested in chit-chat, Jeremiah did seem interested in Kabu, or so Rini deduced from his frequent surveillance of the bushman in his rearview mirror. He did not particularly seem to approve of the little man's presence, although what she had seen of Mr. Daco did not suggest he approved of much of anything. Nevertheless, his covert attention reminded her of her father's reaction. Perhaps this man, too, had believed the Bushmen to be only an old memory. As they drove through the security gate, the swift way in which Daco typed in the code and applied thumb to censor, showing the smoothness of old routine, the house was suddenly visible at the end of the long tree-lined street, like something out of a dream. Tall, clean, welcoming, and just as big as she remembered. Rini had visited Dr. Van Bleek at home just a few times long ago, so she was inordinately pleased to find it so familiar. Daco entered the semicircular driveway and stopped in front of the pillared porch. The effect of its great size was mitigated by the lounger and lawn chairs scattered about on either side of the front door. Susan, Susan Van Bleek was sitting on one of the chairs reading a book, her white hair bright as a candle flame against the dark background. She looked up as the car stopped, then waved. Rini threw open the car door, earning a sour look from the driver who had been about to open it. Don't get up, she cried, then hurried up the steps and hugged her, secretly shocked at how small and bird-like the old woman felt. Get up, Susan laughed. You don't have that much time, do you? She pointed to the wheels on her chair, which had been obscured by the tartan blanket bundled over the doctor's knees. Oh, my God, what's wrong? Rini was a little shocked. Susan Van Bleek looked ancient. She had already been in her late sixties when Rini had studied with her, so it wasn't entirely surprising, but it was still unnerving to see what was just what just two more years had done. Nothing permanent. Well, that's a dangerous thing to say at my age. Broke my hip, basically. All the calcium supplements in the world won't help you if you go down the stairs ass first. She looked past Rini. And this is the friend you said you might bring, yes? Oh, of course. This is Zab, is Kabu. Kabu, meet Dr. Van Bleek. The little man nodded and smiled gravely as he shook her hand. Daco, who had reappeared after parking the car off to one side of the driveway, muttered something as he walked past, apparently to himself. I'd hoped we could sit outside, said their host, frowning at the sky. But, of course, the weather's being bloody. She lifted a frail hand to gesture at the cavernous porch. You know how we Afrikaners are, always out on the stoop. But it's just too cold. By the way, young man, I hope you're not planning to call me doctor all day. Susan will do nicely. She pulled off the blanket and handed it to Kabu, who took it as though it were a ceremonial vestment. Then, without using any controls Rini could see, she turned the wheelchair toward the door and up and over a ramp built into the threshold. Rini and Kabu followed her down the broad hallway. The wheels made squeaking sounds on the, on the polished wooden floorboards as the doctor turned and rolled ahead of them into the living room. How does the chair work? Rini asked. Susan smiled. Pretty slick, don't you think? It's quite clever, really. You can get the kind that's controlled directly from a shunt, but that seemed a little severe. After all, I intend to get out of the damn thing eventually. This one just works off skin contact sensors, reading my leg muscles. I flex, it goes. At first it had to be the old-fashioned, manually, oper manually, manually operated kind, so the bone could heal, but now I can use this as a form of physical therapy. You know, keep the leg muscles in some kind of shape. She gestured to the couch. Please sit down. Jeremiah will bring in some coffee soon. I have to admit I was surprised to hear you are still at the university, Rini said. Susan pulled a face like an extremely wrinkled child trying spinach for the first time. God, what else would I do? Not that I'm in there often. About once a month, really, for something euphemistically called office hours. Mostly I do consultation work right from here. 
but I do have to get out of this place occasionally. There's only so much solitude I can stand, and as you may have noticed, Jeremiah isn't the world's most energetic conversationist. As if demons summoned by the sound of his name, Daco appeared in the doorway carrying a coffee service and cafetier on a tray. He put it down and pressed the plunger. The doctor's appreciation of modern technology apparently did not extend to coffee making, then left the room again, but not without another odd and slightly covert look at Kabu. The bushman, who was looking at the doctor's room full of paintings and sculptures, seemed not to notice. He keeps staring, Rini said, all the way up the hill. He kept looking at Kabu in the mirror. Well, it might be that he fancies him, Susan said, smiling, but I suspect it's a bit of guilty conscience. Rini shook her head. What do you mean? Jeremiah's Agriqua, what they used to call a half-caste in the bad old days, although he's as black as anyone else. A couple of hundred years ago, they drove the Bushmen out of this part of southern Africa. Violently. Horribly. It was a terrible time. I suppose the whites could have done more to stop it, but the hard truth is they saw more potential in the Griqua than they did in the Bushmen. Those were days when having any white blood at all made you better than someone with none. But still nothing like a white. She smiled again rather sadly. Do your people remember the Griqua with hatred, Kabu? Or are you from a different part of the country entirely? The little man looked around. I am sorry. I, I was not listening carefully to what you were saying. Susan gazed at him shrewdly. Ah, you've seen my picture. He nodded. Rini turned to see what they were talking about. What she had thought was merely a wall screen above the fireplace was actually a photographic print, almost three meters wide, bigger than any she had seen outside a museum. It showed a painting on a natural rock wall, a primitively simple and graceful work. A gazelle was described in just a few lines, a group of dancing figures on either side of it. The rock seemed to glow with a sunset light. The paint looked almost fresh, but Rini knew it was not. Kabu was staring at it again. He was holding his shoulders in a strange way, as though something might be stalking him, but his eyes seemed full of wonder rather than fear. Do you know where it's from? Susan asked him. No, but I know it is old, from the days when we Bushmen were the only people in this land. He reached out a hand as if to touch it, though it was a good ten feet from the couch on which he sat. It is a powerful thing to see, he hesitated. But I am not certain I am happy to see it in a person's house. Susan frowned, taking her time. Do you mean a white person's house? No, it's all right, I understand, or I think I do. I don't mean it to give offense. It does not have a religious meaning to me, but I think it's a beautiful thing. I suppose I get spiritual value from it, if that doesn't sound presumptuous. She stared at the photo as if seeing it anew. The painting itself, the original, is still on a cliff face at Giant's Castle in the Drakenberg, Drakensberg Mountains. Will it bother you to see it, Kabu? I could ask Jeremiah to take it down. He won't be doing anything else much for the next few hours, but he's getting a salary anyway. The small man shook his head. There is no need. When I said I was not comfortable, I was speaking of my own thoughts, my own feelings. Rini knows that I have many worries about my people and their past. He smiled. Their future, too. Perhaps it is better that some people can see it here, at least. Perhaps they will remember, or at least wish they could remember. They all three drank their coffee for a while in silence, looking at the leaping gazelle and the dancers. Well, the doctor said at last, if you still want to show me something, Irene, we should get to it or we will miss lunch. 
Jeremiah does not take kindly to alterations in the schedule. Rini had not explained much on the phone. Now, as she began to tell Susan about the mystery file, she found herself revealing more than she had intended. The doctor, trying to get at the context, asked questions for which it was hard to find partial answers, and Rini soon discovered that she had told her old teacher almost everything except the name of the online club and the reason they had gone there in the first place. Old habits die hard, Rini thought. Susan was looking at her expectantly, eyes bright, and it was possible to see not only the powerfully impressive woman she had been when Rini had first met her, but the sharp-witted and sharp-tongued girl she must have been more than half a century ago. I never could lie to her with a damn. But why, in the name of God, would anyone have a security system like that? What on earth could they be protecting? The doctor's intent stare made Rini feel positively delinquent. Have you gotten yourself involved with criminals, Irene? She suppressed a flinch at the hated name. I don't know. I don't really want to talk about it yet. But if they're doing the kind of things I think they are, then, then the place should be burned out like a nest of poisonous snakes. Susan sank back against the cushions of her wheelchair, her face troubled. I, I'll respect your privacy, Irene, but I don't like the sound of this much. How did you get involved in such a thing? She looked over at Kabu as though he might be the cause. Rini shrugged. Let's say that I believe they've got something important to me, and I want it back. Very well, I give up. I never had the patience for Miss Marplish guessing games. Let's see what you've got. Follow me. She led Rini and Kabu down the hallway in her silent chair. What looked like an ordinary pair of French doors opened up to reveal a small freight elevator. Thank God I had this put in for moving equipment, said the doctor. Squeeze in tight now. Since this hip nonsense, if I'd only had the stairs, I wouldn't have been able to get down there for months. Well, maybe I could have made Jeremiah carry me. There's a picture. The basement seemed to cover almost as much space as the house itself. A large part of it was taken up by the lab, which contained several rows of tables in typical laboratory array. Mess and confusion, was how the doctor put it. I've got a clean, standalone system already, and I've finished the antiviral work I was doing with it, she said. We might as well use that. You'd probably just as soon watch this on a monitor screen, wouldn't you? Rini nodded emphatically. Even with Dr. Van Bleek around to help, she wasn't going to put herself in a surround environment to explore whatever gift the Mr. J's folks had sent her. Nobody got to play that trick on her twice. And I think we need to stop there because we've got a large section. Yeah, before there's any break here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah including Kabu's baboon story and all kinds of other things. Um, so, let me slide you in there. Um, I wasn't ready for Dr. Van Bleek. I forgot she came in this early. <laughs> I have no idea what her accent should sound like, but oh well. We'll figure it out. Um, and that's part of the fun, he said, hopefully. Um, anyway. So, with that, I uh, want to mention what? What do I want to mention? I will, of course, be back at 7 p.m. tonight, tonight being Sunday, now that we are Sunday, and it is Sunday, to continue with Rini and Kabu at Dr. Van Bleek's. Um, and anything else I needed to tell you guys? No, not really, not really. I mean, you know, it's just another day. Another day in Wonderland, another day in Otherland, another day in Tadland. And I'm very glad that you dropped in to spend some of it with me. So, as I always say, take good care of yourselves. That's the first part. Take good care of yourselves. That's the first and most important thing. And then you can take care or help to take care of your friends and loved ones. 
and also the people around you that might need a little help. So with that, I once again send my gratitude for you joining me and I will see you either tonight at 7 p.m. or next Sunday at this time uh, during this time slot. And until then, y'all be good, y'all take care of yourselves and enjoy life as best you can. Okay, peace.